Once the bodies had sufficiently dried, he carried them to his home, where he used various methods to give them functional bodies to be used when he eventually discovered a way to bring them back to life, thinking that their physical remains were too decayed and ugly for them to feel comfortable or happy. How thoughtful. Hi everyone, and welcome or welcome back! Today, we are covering the story of Anatoly Moskvin. Anatoly was born in 1966 in Nizhny Novgorod, the fifth largest city in Russia. He is a former linguist, historian, and also a polyglot, speaking no less than 13 languages. He wrote several books, papers, translations, and articles, and was recognized by his peers in academic circles. He had a personal collection of over 60,000 books and documents, which I guess one could expect with his credentials, even though it sounds like a lot. But he also had a large doll collection, which seems a little more unexpected. Just like Carl Tanzler in the previous story I covered, Anatoly was a bit of an eccentric. He was deeply interested in the occult, the realm of the dead, burial rituals, cemeteries, and such. He was also a loner. He lived with his parents, who were often away and wasn't interested in dating at all. He reportedly never engaged in any type of physical relationship, it seems. It is said that he found intercourse to be disgusting. He didn't smoke, he didn't drink either. His almost obsession with the dead and cemeteries drove him to refer to himself as a necropolist. So he started to be seen as an expert on local cemeteries. In 2005, he was commissioned to list the dead in more than 700 cemeteries in the region. He claimed that in the span of two years, he had walked to inspect 752 cemeteries, so up to 30 kilometers or 18.6 miles a day. During his trips, he would drink from puddles, sleep in haystacks and at abandoned farms. He even slept in the cemeteries themselves, laying on the tombs, or going as far as spending a night in a grave hole, being prepared for a funeral. He was sometimes questioned by police for suspicion of vandalism and theft, but was never arrested when he shared his credentials and reasons for being there. Until November the 2nd of 2011, when he was finally arrested on suspicions of grave desecrations in the region. That's when investigators discovered no less than 26 bodies in his apartment and garage. A video released by the police showed the corpses on shelves and sofas in small rooms filled with books and loads of clutter. He was nonetheless suspected of desecrating as many as 150 graves after the police found numerous objects and decorations removed from headstones in his apartment. They also discovered instructions on how to achieve mummification, as well as various photographs and videos revealing open graves and disinterred bodies. However, none of this evidence could be connected to any of the bodies found in the apartment. These mainly came from cemeteries in the region, even though some may have come from as far as Moscow. Anatoly was very cooperative and claimed he made the dolls over the course of 10 years. He correlated his interest in the dead with a childhood incident during which he witnessed a funeral for an 11-year-old girl. He alleged that the participants forced him to kiss the dead girl's face. At the time, he had already started to wander through cemeteries with either his friends or his parents themselves on a regular basis. He recalls this incident, though, to have been sort of a turning point for him. His parents knew of the existence of the dolls, but they thought they were just that, weird-looking dolls that their son was crafting and so they didn't think anything of it. Which is surprising because with 26 bodies in an apartment, there must have been some kind of smell. Anatoly was charged for the desecration of the graves and dead bodies, a charge which carried up to five years in prison. But after a psychiatric evaluation determined that he had a form of paranoid schizophrenia, on the 25th of May 2012, the court deemed him unfit to stand trial and released him from criminal liability. Instead, he was taken to a psychiatric clinic in which he would be kept for the foreseeable future. In an interview after his arrest, he said he felt great sympathy for the dead children and thought that they could be brought back to life, either by science or black magic. 
he had learned that the ancient druids in Celtic culture, amongst others, slept on the graves to communicate with spirits of their dead, so he began searching for obituaries of recently deceased children. He would then sleep on the child's grave to determine if the spirit wished to be brought back to life. He claimed he'd been doing this for about 20 years and specified that when he began, he never dug up a grave without the permission of the child within. He added that as he grew older, it became physically painful for him to sleep on the graves. So he began bringing the bodies home where it would be more comfortable to sleep near them. He hoped the spirits would be more willing to speak in a safe, welcoming home and that they might be easier to hear when they were no longer underground. After exhuming the corpses, he researched mummification theories and techniques to try to preserve the bodies. He dried the corpses by using a mix of salt and baking soda, then hid them in safe, dry places in and around the cemeteries to cure. Once the bodies had sufficiently dried, he carried them to his home, where he used various methods to give them functional bodies to be used when he eventually discovered a way to bring them back to life, thinking that their physical remains were too decayed and ugly for them to feel comfortable or happy. How thoughtful. Unable to stop the bodies from shrinking as they dried, he would wrap the limbs in strips of cloth and stuff the rest of the corpse with rags and padding, much like Tanzler before him. Sometimes he added music boxes inside what would have been the chest area and wax masks painted with nail polish over the faces before dressing them in brightly colored children's clothes and wigs, which prevented them from being recognized as real human remains because it made them look like weird DIY dolls. He was aware that what he was doing was wrong, but said that the children were calling out to be rescued, and so he believed that rescuing the children came first. After his arrest, he even told the parents of the victims, accusingly, you abandoned your girls in the cold, and I brought them home and warmed them up. He was also driven by his wish to have children, specifically a daughter. He often regretted that he never had any, and at one point had even tried to adopt a young girl but his application had been denied due to his low income. He denied any sexual attraction to the dolls and said that he considered them as his children. He spoke to and interacted with the corpses, watched cartoons with them, sang songs to them. He even held birthday parties and celebrated holidays with them, as one would, of course. Some parents of the girls that had been disinterred felt that he got off too easily whereas others thought that he had given their daughter a better second life than the one she had had whilst actually alive. Natalia Shadimova, the mother of one of the little girls who were found, isn't one of these parents. In an article by Will Stewart in Moscow for Mail Online, published in 2014, this is what she had to say. You can't begin to imagine it, that somebody would touch the grave of your child, the most holy place in this world for you. We had been visiting the grave of our child for nine years and we had no idea it was empty. Instead, she was in this beast's apartment. On the 7th of May of 2003, Natalia and husband Igor, 44, started painting a small metal fence they had built around the grave. The next day, they came back to finish and felt someone had been there. The same month, they found a note signed with two letters, D-A, standing for Dobry Angel or Kind Angel, how Anatoly thought of himself. We shivered with fear each time we went to the grave, not knowing what to expect, she said. These sick anonymous notes were addressed to my daughter, calling her Little Lady. He congratulated her on all public holidays. He remembered about the 1st of September each year, the first day of school in Russia, and the last day of school in May. He counted which school grade she was about to enter, as if she was still alive. For example, happy last month of your sixth year at school. Imagine what it was like for us, her grieving parents, reading these notes about our murdered daughter. It was not at all like some sick joke, but a spear through our hearts. Sometimes, the desperate parents arrived at the grave to find soft toys stolen from other plots, and on January the 1st, he always put New Year's decorations on the grave. In one note, he threatened the parents, if you don't erect a great monument, which she deserves, we will dig her body out. The couple erected a headstone in June 2003 and he penned messages on it before taking an axe to it. 
Natalia reported it to the police, who were appalled, but said there was little they could do. Later, the police told Natalia they needed to open her daughter's coffin because 26 mummified corpses of girls from different graveyards had been found at the flat that Moskvin shared with his parents. When we opened the grave with policemen in 2012, we found a coffin there, which looked amazingly well-preserved after 10 years, but it had a hole on the top. Moskvin had dug down, cut the hole, and pulled Olga's body out. I almost collapsed. I felt sick. My girl had been murdered. If anyone deserved to rest in peace, she did, but instead her grave had been robbed. The police said Moskvin's notes showed that the grave had been disturbed in May 2003, the first time Natalia sensed it had been disturbed. They told me not to see her. The sight was too grotesque, they said. But I have seen the pictures of some of the other girls. I still find it hard to grasp the scale of his sickening work, but for nine years he was living with my mummified daughter in his bedroom. I had her for ten years. He had her for nine. For Natalia, there is one more reminder of the man who has caused her such grief. From her kitchen window, she can see the yellow-colored psychiatric hospital where Moskvin is incarcerated. I worry that one day he will convince them he's sane and he'll come out and start his morbid activities again, she said. To me, he got off lightly. The couple have now reburied Olga in an unmarked grave, where finally they hope she can rest in peace. If you want another strange story, and you haven't checked out Carl Tanzler and his corpse bride, which was not his, check him out right here. It's a weird one. It, it's worth a listen. Definitely worth a listen. Don't hesitate to share it. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell. Have a good one, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!